Podes iniciar, Tiago. Ok. Thank you, Mariana. Obrigado, Mariana. So, hi, everyone. Um, good morning. I'm Tiago Capel Lourenço, and I'll um, briefly introduce uh, our today's Encontro Ciência. Uh, thank you again for uh, everybody who is joining our uh, weekly um, Encontro Ciência, um, another one that is uh, online, of course. Hope everyone is uh, keeping safe and keeping healthy. And without further ado, um, I will pass the word uh, to Rui Perdigão uh, from the CCM uh, Research Group at CETRESG. Remember, uh, at the end of the talk today, uh, we're going to have some time for, for questions. Uh, you are able to put those questions uh, in the chat uh, in the YouTube uh, channel. Uh, we're going to have a, a very interesting presentation today, um, but I will leave the presentation, uh, the introduction to Rui, uh, who is going to introduce our speaker today. Rui, are you there? I'm here. Um, okay. Hello, everyone. Super. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much to, for joining this very exciting session. Um, today, I'm most delighted to introduce our esteemed guest speaker, um, engineer Victor Tavares Moraes. Uh, he has a, a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering uh, from the Faculty of Engineering from the University of Porto uh, in Portugal and a Master Degree in Strategy and Industrial Production from uh, ISEC, from the University of Lisbon in Portugal. So quite interdisciplinary and a prosper graduation in strategy execution from INSEAD. So this is uh, the top institution in, uh, in, in management. Um, so Victor Tavares Moraes, he further has 28 years of track records in the utility sector, water, power, and gas utilities, working mainly in regulation, investment planning, and stakeholder management with experience in Portugal and Cabo Verde. And so he is a very uh, cross-cutting interdisciplinary uh, person in independent researcher and also um, we have some uh, collaborations going at uh, in cooperative uh, international setting uh, from Vienna and the United States in a new uh, international center for climate science that is um, that is being uh, sponsored by the Meteoceanics Institute of Vienna and now counts with 36 countries and Vicky Tavares Moraes is part of this collaborative discussion and endeavor of co-construction between companies, uh, universities, research institutes, and of course, the citizens. So I will pass the words to, words to our esteemed guest who is going to um, illuminate us uh, with his perspectives from his field, but again, in a bridge making approach that will benefit us all. Thank you very much for joining. And um, Engineer Victor, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rui. Thank you, Tiago. Um, good morning, everyone. I'll start uh, sharing my, my screen. Um, a moment, please. Please say me if it is okay. It is okay. It's okay. 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 So, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank uh, Professor Rui Perdigão for the, the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here today talking about um, energy, greenhouse gases, resources. And uh, we will have a discussion on green growth and um, if it is enough for, for decoupling. I have to make um, a previous disclaimer and uh, ask uh, for an apology in advance. I do not consider myself uh, as a scientist, okay? So this is not a normal communication science, those you are used to. Uh, this is rather communication on some scientific topic. Okay, uh, um, I have to, to, to confess that I, I prepared this, this presentation for, for a different type of audience. 
probably less aware of the climate and the environmental crisis. Uh, more techno positivist clique, okay, and more techn technical fix guys like me, engineers. Many of you um, that are here today and watching um, on YouTube are more aware of the climate crisis and the environmental crisis impact. So, uh, the, uh, my provocations are are not for are not for you. And. Um, Talking about provocations, uh, nothing better to, to provoke our fellow mainstream economists than start with Kenneth Balding and um, this classic text, test, the, um, the economics of coming spaceship Earth. And who is Kenneth Balding? Who was uh, Kenneth Balding? Uh, he was a, a, a heterodox economist who creates uh, these two opposite concepts, the cowboy economy versus the spaceman economy. Um, let me explain a little bit what is the spaceman economy, since I think you know what is the cowboy economy, OK? Um, the close economy of the future, I'm reading, the close economy of the future might similarly be called the spaceman economy, in which the Earth has become a single spaceship without unlimited reservoirs of anything, either for extraction or for pollution, and in which, therefore, man must find his place in a cyclical ecological system which is capable of continuous reproduction of material form, even through it cannot escape having inputs of energy. And uh, why I bought uh, Kenneth Baldwin here today, so that we can use these metaphoric spaceship Earth for, uh, for uh, an adventure. When um, we are in a spaceship, I, I imagine I, I never been in one. So, um, but I think that the, the most advising thing to do is to look to the instrumental instruments panel, okay? And those are uh, some of the instruments of a spaceship Earth. Uh, a wide range of indicators are proof that um, the spaceship of ours, spaceship Earth, accelerates a lot in the last 250 years since the, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, energy demand, water demand, resource uh, consumption, GDP, uh, uh, GDP increase, CO2 in, uh, emissions, methane emissions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So probably uh, we overeat the, the engines of the spaceship Earth and um, what happened when this occurs? Well, everyone, everyone uh, knows this expression. It's a common euphemism used to, to signal, signal a difficult problem with consequences of which are still unknown. And uh, our, our current situation in the spaceship hurt is the sum of a kind, OK? Um, I, I don't know if you know, the doctor uh, was the astronaut and the, the commander of Apollo 13 when he realized that they had a um, critical situation with the spaceship, but he didn't understand the full impact to the, to the missions and tried to, to contact the, the tower control. So we are now uh, in what I call an Apollo moment. Okay, Our spaceship Earth is in, a, in, a, in an Apollo moment. And why, why I say this is an Apollo moment in terms of climate crisis? Uh, if you read the IPPC report, the 2018 report published um, the, in, uh, about the impacts of the global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius, both uh, pre-industrial levels, compare with an increase of 2 degrees Celsius. And what this report finds with a high degree of confidence that the human activity was already caused 0.8 to 1.2 degrees Celsius of warming. And 
um, that global warming is likely to reach um, between 1.5 uh, in to 1.5 between uh, 2030 and 2052. Of course, it, it, it continues to, to increase at the current rate. Uh, and it warns that um, many of the, the physical impacts of the, the climate change may escalate in a nonlinear um, way as the glo global temperature rise. In other words, um, the effects of the two degrees Celsius warming are likely to be far worse than those of 1.5. So we need to contact the, the tower control and ask for instru instructions and what to do to solve this serious problem and bring the, the earth to its biophysical limits. So we, we should call Houston while we are we have time and then uh, as expected Houston informs us that uh, we should look for a green button on the panel and wait a couple of decades um, until the carbon neutrality is achieved and our problems will be solved so the, the order is press the green button take your pills and carry on uh, as trained scientists uh, and, and astronauts, we obey and here we go. What is the, in fact, the green growth policy? The, the definition of green growth as emerged as a dominant policy response to, to the climate change and to, to the ecological breakdown. Uh, Green growth theory um, asserts that continued economic expansion is compatible with our planet ecology as technological change and substitution will allow us to slip decoupling GDP, so the, the economic growth from resource use and carbon emissions. The, the main definitions of green growth economy um, at the level of uh, multilateral uh, institutions, well, mainly three, okay? Um, by OECD, the other from World Bank, and the third from United Nations. I, I prefer and I choose the United Nations because it seems to me the, the most strong and the most complete because it's the only one that also has an assumed target of decoupling economic growth from the uh, natural resource use. And the others are not so ambitious, okay? What concerns to, to, to resource use. So let's see what do you think, how credible you are. And uh, I, I would like to, to have your opinion on, on the effectiveness of green growth to, to achieve, in order to achieve the, the effective decoupling of the economic growth, of the greenhouse gases and the, the use of resource. So I, I invite you to use your mobile phone, your computer and go please to slido.com and use this code in the screen and answer the, the question. Uh, in the end, we see the we see the, the results, and the, we'll see how credible you, you are. I take just a few more seconds to for you to have time to to copy the the, the code. Okay. So let's go back to the spaceship Earth and try to pay attention to some values. We may be find something that, um, how can I say, reassure us, that tells us that we have time. In a verge of a disaster, the, the, the human beings always feed the, the secret hope of finding an in extremist solution. So let's pay attention on CO2 concentration facts. 
uh, the greenhouse gases are responsible for more than 80% of the total radiative forcing. And climate scientists agree that there is a strong and incontrovertible link between the global greenhouse gas emissions and human activity, okay? And this is not disputable. Um, the global average, um, annual average concentration in the atmosphere of CO2, the, the most important anthropogenic greenhouse gas, the, there are others like methane, but of course the, the CO2 is the most important anthropogenic greenhouse gas, reached to um, 421 ppms in April uh, this year, in April this year, is a major increase from the pre-industrial levels, which are a range between 180 and 280 ppms um, in the pre-industrial levels. And these higher concentrations are, are responsible for, for an increase in the, the, the global uh, average temperature of the planet by about one degree Celsius, okay, as I said before, leading to the, the increase in global sea levels, melting of the glaciers, the reduce of the sea ice, and along with a broader change on weather patterns. Um, the gas, the, the CO2, caused other problems as well. The CO2 dissolved in the, in the upper ocean waters are also causing the uh, world's ocean to become more acid, more the, the acidification of, the, of the, the, the oceans. But, um, well, there's always a, a bright side of life, and uh, this is not Mars. Uh, Elon Musk wants to go to Mars, and Mars has a concentration of 26% uh, of uh, atmospheric CO2, so not so bad. And the question um, we should uh, ask uh, ourselves as, as scientists, if uh, there is any, um, if there is any scientific evidence that proves green growth is safe and sufficient to meet the, the objectives implicit in the international commits, namely the, the Paris Agreement and the, which regard the, the CO2 emissions. Uh, you know, because the, the public opinion view on, on green growth perspective is mainly concerned with uh, making the, the, the growth process uh, research um, uh, resource efficiency, stimulating uh, the, the green technologies, and, and so on and so on. So we, we must go further than, than that on green growth. But in this spaceship Earth, we, we must have a contingency plan somewhere, don't you think? Someone must have already thought about this, what plans exist to prevent the climate crisis, namely with, uh, with, with regard to, to, to energy system, the, the, the first source of greenhouse gases. Let's look uh, briefly uh, at um, the, the plans that um, the International Energy Agency and uh, the, for the scenario that it calls the sustainable development scenario. The scenarios brings the, the global energy system to net zero emissions by 2007 and would lead to a global average temperature rise around 1.65 degrees Celsius at the end of the century with a 50% probability, okay? So in this plan, in this uh, sustainable development scenario, this is the, the plan emissions for CO2 through the period. Uh, if all of energy infrastructures and uh, assets, assets that exist today and those currently, currently under construction uh, were to be used in the similar way as in, as in the past until the end of the, their lifetimes. They have one lifetime. They would, by 
themselves almost entirely exhaust the scope for further emissions consistent with the, the sustainable development scenario. Look, look at the graph, please. The, the, the energy sector and the industrial sector uh, emissions of CO2 would uh, be around uh, 26, 25 gigatons in 2030 and 10 gigatons in 2050, falling to zero by 2070. As I said, this level of, of emissions will lead us to a global average temperature rise of around 1.65 degrees, degrees Celsius. The same graph now by industrial sector. Uh, uh, as we can see, the, the, the main effort came from the coal power sectors, followed by the other power sectors, gas, oil power sectors, and the industrial sectors like steel, cement, chemicals. Is why nowadays you talk, you heard a, a lot about the green hydrogen for the, the industrial sectors. So even the, the, the recent investment in new fossil fuel assets, emissions from the global energy system will decline, but, but the decline will take time uh, if operate under the conditions typ typically uh, observed in uh, each subsector. Existing infrastructures could lead to nearly uh, 750 gigatons uh, in CO2 emissions between now and the end of the period, 2070, in line with the um, other estimates. Uh, and this would exhaust the bulk of the remaining CO2 uh, carbon budget that IPPC estimates, okay? So this scenario is compatible with the um, well below two degrees Celsius uh, scenario, okay? so. There are likely to be additional emissions as well from new fossil fuel infrastructures during the, the next uh, decade in the absence of uh, sufficient development uh, on alternative technology in some, certain subsectors. Um, so uh, an important question is how we deal with the existing infrastructures are, are absolutely critical to consider if any for the, to meet the, the, the global uh, climate is, um, is, uh, is achieved, okay? So we, we, we saw the, the, the graph by, by sector, now let's see by, by type of energy. Look, achieving the, the uh, net zero CO2 emissions require uh, requires a, 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 a range of med, uh, measures and a range of technological transitions. Uh, there are some quick win uh, technology, some quick win opportunities are uh, energy efficiency in, in the uh, industrial process, uh, heating and cooling, uh, fuel economy on vehicles, and of course, probably the most important one, energy from a renewable source, Ma uh, sources mainly, mainly um, wind and solar, solar PV. In, the, in this uh, sustainable development scenario, emissions from the fossil fuel combustion and the, uh, the industrial process drop to three gigatons in 2070 and they, they are offset by negative emission technology resulting in the in net zero emissions. So we, we depend, this scenario is very dependent on negative emissions technology because we don't reach to zero emissions in 2070. We need negative emissions to, 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 to consider this scenario sustainable. So we are a lot dependent on this negative negative emissions technology. And um, for me, uh, there are two main types of, of challenge in, in this scenario. I, 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 and the, in what concerns to, to, to this plan, to, to this International Energy Agency plan. Some that, in, 
some challenges imply behavioral change in the society and economic agents as well. Another are technological challenges, okay? I list here, for me, is the three most important technolo technological challenges. The CCS, all of you know, the carbon capture and storage uh, need to be escalated, otherwise it, it won't work. Uh, and bioenergy. Uh, and this is, um, pay attention, biofuels, to satisfy only 30% of all bio, bioenergy need in this uh, plan, um, still needs the um, a total amount of land to 2.1 million square kilometers. You know what, how many is uh, 2.1 square kilometers? Portugal, Spain, France, Germany, and Turkey. Do, 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 do you think it's possible to achieve just for only for 30% of, of the, the total bioenergy, just crops to, 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 to biofuels? It seems difficult to me. And third one, the third one, uh, one of the, 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 the most technological cha challenge, the, the critical raw materials. And why critical raw materials? Um, uh, we can deny this is a huge uh, challenge, okay? Um, th this energy transition requires the need for uh, more and new and critical raw materials for the new technology, but at a necessary scale, and the, the scale is huge. So I, I, I show here a recent paper on, on, on this team, on this issue, uh, that expressed this, this concern. Um, most mining areas target materials need to for renewable energy productions and areas that overlap with protected areas and remaining wildness contain a greater density of mines compared to overlapping mine, mining areas that target other materials. And we can see a, a global picture where and how uh, the mining areas overlapping with the areas of great biodiversity. Look, South America, Brazil, uh, in Africa, we have Congo, Cameroons, uh, Southeast Asia, we have Indone Indonesia, Papua. Um, but also in Portugal, um, in a recent work by Leneg, uh, that map the resource considered critical by the, the European Union for the energy transition. See where the, the resources are signaled and uh, understand why the, the mining industry is greedily requesting prospecting license and exploration through the north and center of, of the country, even in the, the protected areas like uh, Red Natura. So the the main reasons why we are under this threat um, is the need of the critical raw materials for this energy transition. But okay, um, and, and to serve the, the auto industry in Europe as well. Um, I think that this is a, a note for natural scientists. I think this is a, a field of opportunities for natural scientists to study this overlapping here in Portugal, whereas the overlapping of the future mining industry with the biodiversity hotspots. So at this moment, the, our ast astronauts in the spaceship Earth begins to be seriously concerned with the, the effectiveness of the, the, the green growth. And, Two, two main philosophical considerations. I think um, currently the, the main view of energy transitions, even when we call for replacement of uh, current fossil energy infrastructures with a new and clean renewable energy, 
is also um, an anthropogenic view uh, structures on three factors, increase of productions, extending networks and increasing the, the energy demands. Because the, the energy is the leitmotiv of the, the discourse on, on perpetual growth. And the energy transitions, for me, I used to say this a lot, energy transitions are much more about the future of a society than about the future of energy. Uh, the strict understanding of changing energy infrastructures, moving from fossil energy sources to renewable sources, um, is, a, is a limited view. This decarbonization view is a limited view. Because it, the, the, in the in a, in energy transition, there are important um, social, economic, and, and political change that occurred. Okay, there are redistributions of power, wealth, resilience. So uh, let me say, let me say this. Um, please feel free to discuss the energy transition with any energy geek. Okay with uh, any engineer like me. We know uh, a lot, but uh, we know just a part and probably is not the most important one. So please feel free, discuss the energy transitions. Uh, some uh, interesting energy figures. Um, I, I will I'll pass um, just to show you the, the, the evolution of the, the GDP and the total primary energy demand since the, the end of uh, the Second World War till now. Uh, uh, you may see that the, the, the energy efficiency is decreasing but how, uh, because the GDP is increasing so much, the total energy primary, the total primary energy demand still, still uh, increase. Uh, this is another interesting graph, but um, uh, because it shows the, 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 the other uh, graph on, on perspective of um, uh, that energy demand differs between, between regions and within countries. Um, but uh, we'll go through, through this, this uh, slide because we, we need to talk more about decoupling and we don't have, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, now, um, Let's try to clarify the issue of decoupling GDP, the economic growth from the CO2 or greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I, um, I will read. The, the, the studies suggest that very recently, absolute decoupling between GDP and CO2 or greenhouse gas emissions can be found in some countries but even in those cases, decoupling is so far insufficient to address stringent climate, uh, climate uh, targets, okay? And so uh, the, the decoupling can be found in some countries, uh, but even in those cases is not sufficient to address the, 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 the climate, the climate targets. And, and what, when it happens, it's driven by policies that promote, promote, in, promote renewable energy like in the European Union and as energy efficiency as, as well. But um, you may ask, and what it concerns to, to decoupling the growth for, from resource uses? Well, in this case, it appears to depend on a primary use and accumulation of materials and on extractive expansion or the rising of materials flows elsewhere. Well, it makes sense if you are on a, on a European country, you have stocks uh, of infrastructures, of buildings, railways, so you don't need so, so, so much resource. Um, or, or you, you, you go and go elsewhere to, to, to have them. So as long as the, the case, the coupling of the materials resource cannot be achieved in long term or globally. Is the green growth possible? Uh, answer, answering directly to the, the, the question. 
of effect effectiveness of the green growth for uh, decoupling economic growth from the use of uh, resources and greenhouse gas. I think uh, I picked this study because I think this study is synthesized, this paper synthesized um, in some way what are the main consensus on, on the topic. There is no empirical, uh, I read, there is no empirical evidence that absolute decoupling from resource use can be achieved on a global scale against a background of continued economic growth. And two, absolute decoupling from carbon emissions is highly unlikely to be achieved at a rate, in a rep, a rate rapid enough to prevent global warming over 1.5 degrees to or to uh, over 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius or 2 degrees Celsius, even under optimistic policy, policy conditions. And what are the drivers when decoupling occurs? Well, when there is decoupling, it is fundamentally dictated by um, the adoption, adoption of uh, renewable energy sources and help, helped by low economic growth rates. There are a number of studies that uh, demonstrate that uh, for green growth to, to, to be effective, we need the help of low economic uh, rates, okay? Pay attention, we are not talking about the growth, but we are talking about anemic growth. Uh, so to grow or not to grow is the Shakespeare question. And uh, here we return to, to Kenneth Baldwin. This quote is here just for provocation purpose. Anyone who believes in perpetual growth or is a madman or uh, uh, an economist. This question, uh, the, the uh, limits of growth, of economic growth was very re relevant in the middle of the, the last century. Uh, with uh, scientists uh, like uh, Jay Forrest, Daniela Meadows, or economists uh, like uh, Nicolas Georgiescu argue, arguing for the, the limits of economic uh, growth, okay? But the, our neoclassic fellows, economists, um, uh, respond uh, promptly to, to this heterodox economist such as the, the Nobel Prize in Economics, Solo, and, and Stiglitz as well. And the, the answer was another question, not easy to answer question at the time, and one that put um, defenders on the limits of growth in the face of um, a serious moral dilemma. Um, it is, it is very curious that uh, after so many years, it's still the, uh, uh, the, the same argument that is used to, by the defenders of the perpetual growth, the moral imperative of growth. So uh, let's read how Sol respond, respond in this article. I think that those who oppose continued growth should, in honesty, face up the implications of their positions for distribution equity, equity uh, sorry, and the prospects of the world's poor. What, what a statement. If um, 50 years ago, we could still accept the supremacy of the argument of the economic growth, uh, as the only moral imperative in the discussion of the growth of the growth. Uh, today, I think we have scientific knowledge that give us a whole other context, context for, for, for this discussion. Uh, we have already crossed some biophysical limits on the planet and we are on a threshold of, of overcoming others which are uh, threats not only to, of poverty, but uh, of uh, are existential threats to, to humankind. Uh, so Earth in the 2020 is a different planet uh, than in uh, 1970. Um, 
And uh, I think uh, this audience is perfectly aware of this. I quote here Professor um, Viriato Sormanio Marques um, between the famous year of 1970 and 2060, the populations of ma mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles, and fish decreased by 68%. And in subtropical regions of America, where the massacre of species reached the figure of 94%, of the populations existing in 1970. But um, the neoclassics do not disarm, and more than 50 years later, they insist on the same exact argument. And now the ambition seems even great, greater, a fivefold increase in a minimum estimate of the, the, the economic growth that is necessary to address the, the global poverty, okay? No comment on that. Just a second. It seems um, difficult today to explain that the universe work as a complex system with connections and feedbacks that will we still do not fully understand. And if we continue along the path we, we have been following, it's our existence that is threatened and not so much of planet itself. The planet will remain, not us. Um, I'm an engineer and I'm not disregard our amazing technologies. We, uh, the human race, achieved an amazing set of technology in the last uh, 200 years. But we must be humble. Um, it's nothing comparing the complexity with the single life species in million of uh, years of, of uh, evolution. Um, now you, you can ask, Ask and um, and solutions. You 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 only both uh, as doubts, problems, point out some some solutions. Um, if I were in the audience, it's what I, I would demand. Well, um, if you like solutions and uh, simple solutions to very complex problems such as the, um, the climate and the environmental crisis. I leave you here with two recommendations for solutions, uh, recommendations from the industrial technocracy, okay? But with a, a, a disclaimer, previous disclaimer. Do you know what is said about the simple solutions to, to complex problems? Um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm quoting Mark Twain. Uh, for every complex problem, there is a solution that is simple, neat, and completely wrong. So the simple solutions are geoengineering, um, uh, nuclear energy, um, bring people from the fields to, to, to the cities. Um, this, those are simple solutions. So where, where's the complexity? Uh, do you remember we, we, we pressed that uh, green growth but button and um, and where is the, the complexity in the green growth solution? Since the, the green growth just address a, a limited type of science, uh, uh, physics, maths, engineering, and a green growth perspective is mainly concerned with making growth process, uh, as I said, resource efficient, stimulating the demand for uh, green technology, green goods, green service, we need more link and feedbacks with other subsystems, subsystems mainly negative feedbacks, okay? Not, not just the positive feedbacks for growth. Um, the, 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 the large majority of the green growth literature does not question the, the, the growth paradigm, paradigm, the economic growth paradigm. Even if the, the empirical evidence suggests that it contradicts the official commi uh, climate commitments, commitments okay? Um, and I think this is the, 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 this is a problem. Um, the green growth, 
paradigm is not so scientific as it seems. I, uh, I think we don't need the green growth. There is a, a steroid on economic growth and a, a placebo on the environmental and social uh, side. Uh, relate with the biodiversity or the oceans, for instance. Uh, where are the other subsystem connect, connected in the, um, in the green growth, the, the biosphere, the geosphere? So for me, the green growth is, is not the kind of panacea, okay? And what I suggest, I, I suggest that the, the, the green growth policy because it's an economic policy, needs a, a lot of cross pollination on science and more focus on natural and social science, uh, quantitative, but as well qualitative um, investigations into the political side of the, the, the policy. Um, I'm ending my, my presentation as I started talking about our Apollo moments. Um, we must understand that when we have different and various existential threat at the same time, occurring at the same time, like those we have today, we need to address them all. Um, you don't solve an existential crisis at the, at the time because one is enough to kill us all. Uh, if, if we don't solve this complex and uh, existential uh, challenge on a, a systemic approach in, near, uh, in, in the near future, I, I imagine the, the, the anguish of the scientific community as, uh, as the astronaut in the spaceship Earth like that, you know, the, Major Tom in the David, uh, David Bowie, Bowie song, uh, alone um, in the void and uh, without the, the sure to be heard, singing this verse, here am I floating around my thin can, far above the moon, planet Earth is blue and there's nothing I can do. It's not a very awful message uh, to conclude, but I prefer the, the most complex and effective solutions that the simple and wrong ones. Thank you. Okay, Th thank you, Vitor, for the presentation. Uh, very interesting presentation. I will just... Uh, waiting for Mariana to give me the cue on any questions. But uh, meanwhile, while we wait for, for the questions in uh, at the YouTube channel, so uh, for those listening, uh, if you have any specific question to Vitor um, on his presentation, please go ahead and, and just type it uh, in, the, in the chat room. Meanwhile, I will give the floor to Rui Perdigão so he can also um, ask his questions if, uh, if he has any, uh, or discuss what we just heard. Rui? Um, well, thank, thank, you, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Vito, for the interesting presentation, for the insights that you shared, um, for bringing across uh, these needs uh, for, for the cross-pollination across natural, technical, and social sciences uh, to build uh, a stronger future together um, for bringing across uh, with a very uh, nice example, uh, very illustrative and creative example of the spaceship Earth and our, because in the end, this is the notion that in the economic system is, uh, uh, is largely missing, is the notion that um, in the traditional economic models that you have this exponential growth that you can just go up and essentially violate thermodynamics, that we cannot produce more um, with limited resources and we don't live in an infinite planet. Uh, you, you came across in a very clear, effective manner. I really appreciate that. Before I ask any question, I would not want to condition the audience. So I would like to check first whether there is any written question that would be asked. And then I would, uh, uh, if, there is no further questions. 
there are no further questions, then I can ask. Um, you, you can, please. Just go ahead. You can, you can ask. Okay, okay. Can I share the, the results of the quiz first? That would be great. That would okay. be great. Sure, go ahead. Yes, yes. Okay. It was a very creative idea, uh, this quiz. To gauge the, the view of the, the community in this regard. So we can see, uh, Fito, what are your insights about this result? Uh, it's very interesting. I'm not expecting this, this result, but um, uh, it seems very interesting. The, so uh, half, half are credits and believe that uh, we, we can, uh, the, uh, the green growth in, uh, is enough for the coupling from resource use and greenhouse gases. And uh, the other half uh, think it is possible, but not in, is uh, not be in time. So it's an interesting, um, uh, in a, it's an interesting result, I think. What do you think, Rui? So what, what I see, what I, oh, in the meantime, we have another vote coming in. Okay. Saying that it's possible it will not be in time to meet international commitments. Um, that possibility is, uh, is quite sensible. Uh, why? Because so it, uh, it keeps the uncertainty in the air uh, because in the end, one major feature of a complex system entails the existence of choice. So the existence of degrees of freedom, the existence of bifurcations and forcations, the existence of alternative stable states, alternative regimes, alternative behaviors. And that then allows the uncertainty of the evolution of our earth system, our society, our economy, to be something that is not purely um, linearized and that is not that even non-linear deterministic, but actually something that um, in a way you pointed out that we, essentially we have this complexity appearing and complexity is not just about um, having uh, um, uh, unknown unknowns, and uh, interactions that are elusive to common understanding, but actually the existence of surprise, of an element of surprise. So the fact that you have these answers uh, brings across that sensation that uh, the community is aware that there is an element of surprise stemming from the fact that the combination of the parts, of the stakeholders, of the players, of nature, technology, society together that the emerging patterns of the climate of the future and of the energy systems of the future is not something that is essentially um, uh, projectable with this kind of uh, uh, past century statistical extrapolative and projective tools, but something that requires uh, the sun science. I was super happy that you put the general relativity equation as an example of what we actually need, the hard science because we have a lot of society that thinks that we can solve the climate crisis with uh, fairy tales, unicorns and rainbows. And we sit all together around the fire and we meditate and oh, and the problems get solved. No, we need mathematics. You need proper science to make the computations looking and to grab the bull by the horns. And this is what you are doing. So grabbing the bull by the horns, it is not something sexy, it is not something uh, beautiful, but it is something that really triggers change. And indeed, whether or not we have green tech uh, and green growth enough to uh, for this decoupling is an open question. It depends on our choices. And in order to make informed choices, we need engineers like you, we need uh, scientists, we need natural scientists, social scientists, economists to, to sit together. And this is another take home message from your talk that is always important, that we need to cross pollinate. What you are seeing a lot in environmental science is that physics and math are jumped and out of the game. So you have essentially a lot of community talking without knowing uh, 
anything about climate physics, about climate chemistry. And, um, and this is why you see a lot of uh, misconceptions about energy growth and green tech and um, some hope that is unfounded that green energy alone can suppress anything. Well, you need to bring the sun on earth. You would need actually fusion technology, which is not polluting. But people are against fusion, why? Because they confuse it with fission, which is producing radioactive waste. And fusion is what the sun does. So, and that is also clean, that is also green. And that would be enough to suppress our energy goals and to keep us afloat. However, if we just think about um, pseudo-sustainable uh, sources of energy that are apparently clean, but in the end they're not so clean because they require batteries, and, but then you have to go and destroy the mountain to, to get the lithium out of it and contaminate the groundwater. Or solar panels, well, but the solar panels need rare minerals that will also pollute the environment. So we need, there is no pure green and there is no uh, silver bullet. Everything has a downside and we have to be very careful. We cannot just live off of uh, panels and windmills. We need more energies that are clean and that are not destructive. Uh, ah, we have the dams, but then the dams have a, a tremendous effect on the ecosystems. Uh, uh, hydropower in Austria, it is being scaled down. It's being scaled down because hydropower is not green, is not eco, is anti-eco, is destroying the ecosystems. And there are better ways to produce green energy. So is it enough? We don't know, it depends on our choices, on how green we make our green technologies, on how we understand, okay, that things we think that are green may not be that green, and things that we think are not green, perhaps they are greener. But this is the thing, it depends on what we do with the tech. For all that matters, there is no technology that cannot be green if we don't take good care. It needs to be something that uh, is not sustainable with the money of others, like the pseudo green tech that is subsidized by the state. Ah, that's why it's sustainable. No, it has to be something that does not destroy our planet. And that actually brings us the power of choice. And it is something that I appreciate that you bring across. Something that is not a miracle silver bullet. Uh, and I would like to hear your comments about what you think in your background from having worked so many years and still working in the utilities sector, um, what kind of uh, energy uh, paradigms would you personally like to see more in place? And what, what, what is your judgment and what is your opinion um, about the other side of the coin? What do you feel is needed for green tech to become actually greener. Peter, thank you. Just, thank you. just, just to uh, step in, just in, uh, a very quick question that uh, appeared uh, and that goes in line with uh, what you were and uh, who you were just uh, describing uh, from Vitor, colleague of ours, who, who asks uh, to you if you think that. Uh, well, to both of you, actually, uh, if you think that on the top of a, a better scientific understanding of, of ecosystems and, and, and climate or, and other elements uh, of the Earth system, we rather need changes in the economic vision uh, by removing or rethinking the concept of growth. So in line with what uh, Victor uh, expressed. So you can, you can address both questions if you want before we close the session. May I? Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so to the, the, the second question, I'll go absolutely direct. Yes, I think we need to, to revise the, 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 the economic concept of, of growth. I think it's obvious. Um, answering uh, to, to, to the, the other question uh, of Rui, what uh, type of energy I, I favor, I think the, the, the Renewable energies, mainly the, the, the most important ones like um, wind and uh, solar PV, are very important for, for a, a sustainable future. 
uh, said that um, the, the energy, the renewable energy, okay, is green, but it's not intelligent if we don't put intelligence on that, okay? Because it's different to, to, to put a, a solar panel, a solar farm, a big solar farm on, on, um, on a, a good soil for agriculture or a, on a forest. If you cut the forest to put a, a, a solar PV, it, it's not green, it's not intelligent, it's not human. Uh, so, the, the, the technology depends how you, you, we use it, okay? So we must address the questions. It's why, why we think, uh, I, I think we, we need to, to, to cross all, all the system. We must see this overlapping. If I put the, the, the solar PV in, um, in the des deserts or in um, uh, some type of, of land that is not used or, or need time to, 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 to become more um, uh, proper for the agriculture again, it's different to, to use the, 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 the area of, the, of a forest, forest or other uh, kind of um, biodiversity hotspots to, to, to put the, the renewable energy. The, the wind has the, the, the same problem. The critical raw materials has the same problems. Okay, we need critical raw materials. We must use critical raw materials for um, uh, the, this renewable energy, but we need it for um, 90 million uh, vehicles per year. We, we want to remain with that paradigm. Of course, we don't have um, uh, rare uh, earth elements for, for, for that. So we have to destroy the, mount, the mountain. So of course we need electric vehicles, we need lithium, we, we need cobalt, but uh, it's different to extract uh, the lithium uh, in uh, Australian deserts or extract lithium in the um, uh, north of Portugal where the village uh, are five, three kilometers away of, of each other. So um, I, I, I favor, of course, the, 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 the renewable energy. I think um, we, we, we need to, to keep going with the, the same kind of energy that we use today in order to, to phase out uh, slowly, but phase out some of the most pollute, polluted ones like um, coal or uh, gas, less. But uh, uh, I think we must go through uh, renewables energies and uh, there are, there are uh, a lot of um, investigation and, and uh, technologies, uh, uh, new technology that then, then can uh, go for, uh, for that purpose. Okay, hey, Peter. Oh, yes. I think we will. We, will, we, don't have we are right on, okay, on top okay. of the hour. Okay. So um, thank you, thank you again for for the the, the very interesting uh, presentation and and for this discussion and for answering uh, the questions of uh, uh, our colleagues. Uh, also to thank uh, Rui, of course, for uh, for presenting and, and for your discussion. Um, and obviously to thank uh, Mariana for setting up. Uh, the the webinar and for setting up the encounter as she does uh, every week. Uh, it's a great job. Thank you for keeping this going. I think it was a quite interesting discussion and presentation. Um, don't uh, forget to tune in next week for another uh, webinar. And uh, meanwhile, have a, a rest of a pleasant week. And uh, Vitor, thank you again for your uh, insights, for your presentation and for joining Seatrici with your um, with your ideas and and thoughts thank you again and thank you. Uh, have a great day thank you bye thank you bye